because we recognize the concern with e-cigarettes. Um, they've markedly increased, of course, in adults, and unfortunately in adolescents, that's been a huge issue for us. We've heard about the cardiovascular risks, we've heard about the flavorings, we've heard about e-cigarettes and smoking cessation, and I want to really focus more on adolescents because we really need to look at where the risk is because if we want to intervene, the best way to do it is look at the risk. We're going to be able to make more inroads if that's what we do, which will help then to lead to a smoke-free tomorrow. So if we look at the data, nine out of 10 cigarette smokers actually started before the age of 18. So I feel that tobacco use should be considered a pediatric disease process. If a person can make it to age 21 without smoking, the likelihood that they're going to smoke actually is quite a bit smaller. It's important to notice also, though, that tobacco use during youth has immediate health consequences. If you have asthma, if you have allergies, and then, of course, we have our long-term progression to chronic diseases. So what... Dr. King had discussed previously, we know that children, adolescents who use e-cigarettes are more likely to progress to cigarette use. We've talked about the flavorings that occur. Uh, from what I've looked, sometimes there's close to 7,000 flavorings. Remember these flavorings have these wonderful names like, of course, creme brulee and mango tango, and it makes it very alluring to an adolescent to hear these kind of things. It's renormalized smoking, which I think is a huge issue for us. I can go to a restaurant in the Louisville community and I can feel assured that I'm probably not gonna have someone smoking next to me a cigarette, but I can easily be surrounded by three or four people that are vaping. So, you know, again, it's made it more normal. When we look at advertising, as Dr. King alluded to also, advertising is a huge issue. Uh, we have limits on cigarette advertising, but when we look at what you can have with vaping, there aren't limits on that. And then, of course, it's made it, as I said, largely, largely indistinguishable from cigarettes. So adolescence is a critical window, and I think that's what's important. What we have is a imbalance that occurs. We have adolescents who are... Uh, learning and, and processing in an immature way. Uh, they don't have the reasoning capabilities. They don't have the frontal lobe capabilities. They are looking for excitement. They're looking for things that are going to just kind of make them a little bit special and a little bit unique. So they're highly vulnerable to any outside influences. And I'm sure you can appreciate marketing companies for Juul, for Mark 10 for blue, anyone, they know that. They know how to capture these adolescents. So let's look at the adolescent brain activity and let's compare it to the adult. So in the adult, it is more frontal lobe activity. That is our thinking, that is our reasoning, that is our planning versus an adolescent where we have more activity occurring in the deeper parts in the amygdala and the hippocampus. And so that is more of the pleasure areas. And look at judgment. If we look at MRI scans of adolescents and looking at it from child, so the red and yellow area are parts of the brain that are less fully mature, the blue, purple are parts of the brain that are more mature. You can see the progression you'd anticipate. You have a five-year-old brain, pretty immature, and you see the progression. What's important to point out is when we look at long-term consequences and look at controlling impulses, even in a 20-year-old brain, we are having some areas of immaturity that are occurring. So what we have is the prefrontal mm -hmm. cortex still developing. Again, as I reiterate, decision-making, impulse control, executive functioning. We have the adolescent brain that is uniquely vulnerable to this nicotine addiction. Smaller amounts of nicotine will create addiction in an adolescent versus an adult. And again, addiction occurs when youth are experimenting. So early use of cigarettes, it's harder for them to quit. It's harder for them to, uh, uh, they have earlier addiction and then they have a greater risk of progressing to even daily smoking. <clears throat> 
So to recapitulate, teens are uniquely vulnerable to nicotine addiction. Most e-cigarettes, as Dr. King alluded to, contain nicotine. Juul, Fix, Mile, any other high nicotine e-cigarettes are particularly problematic. And teens who use e-cigarettes are more likely to progress to using traditional cigarettes. So because I'm a pediatrician and uh, I'm always trying to capture children's attention, uh, I want to tell you guys, I've had a jewel in my hand the entire time I'm up here, and multiple times I've put it to my mouth, and I'm sure that you all probably didn't notice that I did that. Now, I don't have it on, but I do have it in my hand, and I've been able to hold it with very minimal, probably, recognition on your all's part. So I think that's a huge issue to take mm. into consideration. Remember, that's what the manufacturing companies are doing. They're making these products so that they're easy for an adolescent to have and it makes it more alluring to them. So, thank you. So our last speaker is Dr. Melissa Abadi. She's a research scientist at, at the Pacific Institute uh, for Research and Evaluation. Hi, everybody. So today I'm going to talk about e-cigarette use among Kentucky youth, uh, including exposure to marketing and co-use with other substances. I'd like to briefly acknowledge my co-authors, one of which is here, Kirsten Thompson. Uh, the research presented here is supported by a NIDA FDA-funded research grant, an R03 mechanism, which will serve as uh, pilot data for a larger, more rigorous R01 trial. So we've kind of talked about e-cig marketing today, but briefly I just want to say that a lot of tension is attention is given to e-cig marketing because of the lack of regulation on marketing um, at state and federal levels and the possible impact on youth. The FDA does not currently regulate the marketing or distribution of e-cigs and state laws are having a hard time keeping up with the vast array of products and marketing tactics. The lack of regulation has allowed for um, industries to launch very expensive, read pervasive and effective media campaigns. Um, you know, you can see here that uh, um, uh, 10 million high school students and 8 million middle school students were exposed to e-cigarette ads in 2014. Um, as Dr. King presented earlier, this has actually risen by another 2 million by 2016, and I'm sure by 2018 we'll see even higher numbers exposed. Um, when um, e-cigarettes increased in popularity vastly, um, e-cigarette advertising spending increased from 6.4 million in 2011 to 115 million in 2014, and the numbers keep growing. Lack of regulation also means that advertisers can directly target youth. As we've heard today, there are a lot of youth appeals, um, including um, trendy and sleek devices, the fact that they're easy to hide or disguise, um, they have nice mouth flavor, no afterturn, no, or no aftertaste. Uh, no burning in the lungs, a favorable taste due to flavors, and um, additionally, not really discussed here today, there's no um, stigma-related consequences like there are with tobacco cigarettes, which is also very problematic. This is also problematic because research suggests that exposure to such marketing actually creates a, an environment that is favorable to e-cig use and um, increases positive attitudes towards e-cigarette and tobacco use as well as use and initiation of both products. This is particularly concerning in a tobacco growing region uh, such as Kentucky, where we already see favorable norms for tobacco. So today I'm gonna to present some um, early findings from a current study we um, are conducting with Kentucky youth. Uh, we recruited youth through schools and flyers at youth events. We conducted a baseline survey that collected demographics, attitudes, beliefs, um, exposure to various influences, and past 30 day year and lifetime ATOD use. And then we conducted a two-week ecological momentary assessment, or EMA, which consisted of 24 surveys that were asked daily across a two-week period. The data that I'm presenting today is actually with um, a sample of 50 youth who reported past two-week e-cig or e-cig and tobacco use. A little bit about our sample here. 40% were male, 90% were white. About half, or 48%, were 17, year 17 years old. 33% were 16 years old, and 19% were 15 years old. 96% of our sample had ever knowingly vaped nicotine. We had another 4% that um, said they were just vaping flavors, but when we asked what device they were using, they reported Juul, and so we included them in our sample because we knew they were vaping nicotine. 
Um, we think that could have even been higher had we learned um, that all Juul devices contained nicotine earlier in the study. 48% ever had smoked tobacco cigarettes. By 14 years old, 46% had vaped nicotine and 26% had smoked cigarettes. I just want to take a quick minute here, since we've talked a little bit about survey measures, that all of our survey measures related to e-cigs did ask about vaping nicotine specifically. Also, since we talked about flavors earlier, I did want to mention that 43% uh, uh, reported just vaping a flavor the first time they ever vaped, and 87% vaped a flavor either with or without nicotine the first time. So in order to help verify use, we asked you to take a picture of their e-cig devices. Um, and the daily survey showed that the majority of, of times, youth were reporting use of Juuls, um, which is not surprising given Juuls' current market share. Uh, we actually thought it might be higher, but we think that because we were um, enrolling a more regular user sample that um, it's possible that these users are actually using different types of devices that they can modify. So um, other popular brands were Smoke, T-Priv, Mag, Drag, Thorin, and 13% didn't know what device they were using. But you can see here that youth are definitely personalizing their devices. We have one picture on top of a biology book. We have um, pictures in the bathroom and apparently their parents' living room. Kind of just, they're, they're everywhere. They're vaping everywhere. So a little bit here of our preliminary findings, just a report on prevalence of exposure to marketing um, and, and daily use. So 74% of the time, youth were vaping daily. And the, again, this is a sample of 15 to 17 year olds, which is really high. Um, intention to vape with nicotine the next day was 47%. When we asked about exposure to e-cig marketing, 37% of the time they were seeing ads in social media, 28% uh, of the time they were seeing ads near their neighborhood, 19% of the time they were seeing ads in magazines, TVs, or movies, and 17% of the time they were seeing ads near schools. We also asked about their daily exposure to prevention or health warning messages, and 13% of the time they said they were seeing these messages. Importantly, daily exposure to marketing was positively associated with willingness to smoke or vape e-cigs the next day. So switching gears here a little, I was also asked to report on our preliminary data related to youth co-using e-cigarettes with other substances. This is a really important question for all of us to ask because research suggests that youth e-cig users are, have an increased likelihood to use um, additional substances, including tobacco, alcohol, marijuana, and other illicit drugs. In addition, we also know that dual and poly tobacco users have a higher propensity to develop addiction later in life, and they also have reported greater exposure to and openness to tobacco promotion and marketing. So here you can see that the most commonly um, used substance in addition to e-cigs is actually marijuana at 51%, followed by alcohol at 47%, cigarettes by 33%, and cigars um, at 22%. Since marijuana use was so high, we also asked um, about whether they were using THC liquid with their e-cig devices. So a couple of important um, stats from our baseline data, 90% said it was easy to obtain a nicotine e-liquid, 64% said it was easy to obtain access to THC oil. Looking at lifetime use, you can see that 96% had ever vaped nicotine, 46% had ever vaped THC oil, and 78% had smoked marijuana. Um, going back to our daily survey, we found that vaping nicotine, again, was reported 74% of the time, and on those occasions, they were also using marijuana 27% of the time, either vaping or smoking. So I just wanted to quickly um, note some implications here that have already, some of these have already been addressed today. Clearly, there's a need for policy and interventions to reduce impact of e-cigarette advertising. We really need marketing restrictions for all tobacco products, similar to those existing for tobacco cigarettes, um, particularly for retail and online. Um, as we know, a large part of Juul's success has been using social media to gain attention. And what we're finding with our youth in our surveys is that there's definitely a blurred line between what's real marketing and advertising versus what's social media. We also need to better understand the relationship between tobacco and nicotine marketing exposure and subsequent e-cigarette and tobacco cigarette use and also better understand the influences and trajectories of co-use among e-cigarette users with other substances. And that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you. Yes.
At this point, I think we'll take questions from the audience and we can have a discussion with the panel. You can direct your questions to actually individual members of the panel, or if you wanted to just ask uh, the panel in general, both, both approaches be okay. Just a reminder again, we're using Slido, but if you don't use Slido and you ask a question, Dr. Bhatnagar, would you please repeat the question so that our viewers in other locations can hear? Yeah. So the first question is, in recent tobacco ed groups for student tobacco violators, all participants were Juul users. They said Juul no longer contains propylene glycol. Is that true? Anybody from the panel want to address that? I think it contains both polypropylene glycol and glycol and glycerol. They still do, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With e cigs being used for harm reduction, what would you say to a parent who gives um, an e cig to their child because the child is smoking cigarettes? They have a pediatrician in the group. Maybe <laughs> we should address it. There's many complexities to that question. I think if you have someone, and, and this is still in the, in the preliminary stage, if we have an adolescent that possibly is addicted to cigarettes, uh, I think that there's going to have to be some smoking cessation that is going to have to occur with them. I don't know whether I would personally, as a pediatrician or even as a mother, suggest to my child that that would be a viable alternative. I would look at some other nicotine replacement therapy in conjunction with their pediatrician as being the most helpful. Uh, th what someone has asked before, which I thought was interesting, and, and we're probably going to see that, are we going to have a, a group of adolescents that are going to be addicted to e-cigarettes that we're going to have to wean them off of e-cigarettes and the nicotine content with that? which is a, a different animal in and of itself. So uh, I think there probably are many adolescents out there that, that are now. Can I just add something to that? Because, you know, traditionally um, using nicotine replacement for adolescents for smoking cessation really hasn't been a thing. You know, behavioral strategies have been found to be most effective, but we're in a new world with you know, these higher concentrations of nicotine, particularly in e-cigarette devices, um, youth, you know, at, starting at younger ages. So I think that we need to look at those recommendations sort of with a little grain of salt, and uh, we clearly need more data, I think, in, in that area. The other thing, too, the Academy of Pediatrics has kind of worked with us as pediatricians and has asked that when we have a family come in, that, oh, um, we have, they have asked that when a family comes in and we discuss smoking cessation that is well within our uh, jurisdiction to consider uh, smoking cessation treatment for the parents also. Mm -hmm. So there's a real push to be more inclusive of that. So if someone comes in, I'm not going to be just taking care of the child. I can also offer replacement therapy to the parent also. Yep. I would just like to add that, you know, I, I, ask, I get asked this question a lot about whether you will have your child smoking e-cigarette or a, a regular cigarette, and then uh, whether the answer is easy, neither. But the thing is that there are two specific reasons why e-cigarettes may actually be problematic in the youth to, for cessation. Number one is they're easy to hide. So you can actually increase your nicotine uptake than you could even get from cigarettes. And then it's very difficult to wean off once you get to a high level of addiction. Second, there is emerging evidence that suggests that they can act as catalysts for, going, uh, for nicotine addiction and going on to uh, use of combustible uh, products. The, the third is that even if you are, you know, you can wean off from, to, from this, it has been shown, at least in some studies, that people who use e-cigarettes find it more difficult to quit cigarettes than people who don't use e-cigarettes. So it may even may, may make cessation harder than otherwise, and we can sort of have to fall back upon accepted modes of intervention for cessation. Something I just wanted to add that we learned from our sample too is that uh, parents who are comfortable with their kids using e-cigs because at least it's not tobacco or they think that they're using tobacco, um, they've, they're actually an important source of access for youth. Uh, we found 23% of our samples said they were using e-cigs uh, to quit tobacco and we actually spoke to parents who were very aware that their kids were using e-cigs and they would give answers like, well, at least they're not using tobacco cigarettes or I've seen tobacco cigarettes in, you know, their room, and so I'm, you know, I got them an e-cig device to try to get them to stop using tobacco. So they're an important source of access as well. Thank you.
The next question is, why was there a spike in trying e-cigarettes at 14 years old, but then dropped after that? Gavadi, did you? What was that? I'm sorry. What there was, was a, a spike in trying e-cigarettes at 14 years old, and then <laughs> dropped after that. Okay. But I can just... So I can start with saying that uh, there in adolescent, when you heard, saw the brain has uh, uh, not fully developed, and so there is something known as an experimentation phase, and children uh, generally experiment with many times, uh, before, uh, even youth, before they actually become addicted and, uh, to cigarettes and or to nicotine and use them on a daily basis. Now, this is the reason why the FDA is now trying to reduce the levels of nicotine in cigarettes uh, so that even when they have tried the, the cigarettes many times, they would have lesser probability of being addicted. So this phenomenon of experimentation might be responsible for the spike at a certain age and then it falls off when, when they e either quit or they become smokers. The other question is, we know action needs to be taken and slowly has begun. How quickly can we expect policy changes at the federal level or state level? I'll speak to the federal level. Um, it, it depends. Um, uh, as I noted, there is no e-cigarette that has received um, pre-market authorization approval from the FDA. So they're not legally marketed. It's only at the FDA's discretionary um, enforcement that we still see e-cigarettes in the market. And as they moved last week uh, or a few weeks ago, they are doing, uh, they've extended till 20 22, I think it is, um, the time that companies have and can keep their products on the market before they have to get authorization. But they can pull that back anytime. They don't need to do, go through new rulemaking. But any legislation, uh, any action that needs new rulemaking can take, um, as we've seen with the Dean Rule, it can take uh, years. And if there's, if it's outside of their current authority, then it can, it requires um, Congress to act. And we see that Congress does not act very quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the second question is, are there any evidence-based cessation programs for youth? Of course, there are evidence-based which don't actually involve the use of e-cigarettes. Right. Um, <laughs> in, <laughs> there are, um, in the state of Kentucky, as in many states, there are limited access to adolescents in terms of smoking cessation. Uh, most programs are geared for 18 and above. Norton Healthcare, which we're all familiar with in the market here in Louisville, does have one available for 18 and up. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you, anyone that is trying to do that, punt it to your pediatrician. I mean, we are invaluable sources of nicotine replacement therapy. We can talk to you and we can try to jerry-rig some things, but in terms of a program specifically for adolescents, I don't. The quit line does uh, counsel down to age 15. And in terms of just cessation um, evidence for youth, uh, youth cessation programs, there are a lot of youth prevention programs. But my understanding is that out of MD Anderson, the Aspire program is really pretty much the only one that's really gone there in a serious way. So you can find information about the Aspire program on the MD Anderson website. How did the prior study recruit and are they rural or urban youth? I'm so sorry, I was taking a note. <laughs> <laughs> what was the question? Uh, uh, how was it with your recruitment and, and whether they were urban or rural? Uh, so we had kind of a, a mix. We um, Our catchment area was 100 miles from downtown Louisville and so we could include any. Um, I think we ended up having about 30% rural. Is that what you remember? Yep. <laughs> okay, about 45% rural, so almost split. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. How long will it take to better understand the long-term health effect impacts of e-cigarettes? Well, so there is a lot of work that's currently underway. We have already obtained a lot of evidence about the acute effects of e-cigarettes uh, in the respiratory systems as well as, as, well as cardiovascular systems. Uh, the long-term effects take some time to appear. And so we, have, we don't have as yet a long-term cohort study to look at how when people who use e-cigarettes are affected in the long term for 10, 15 years. But we have data from one study called the PATH study, which might actually give us some data about the initial uh, sort of effects. It, is, it has limitations. I presented some data about the, the rates of myocardial infarction people. So I think that it will be an ongoing process as data emerges in a few years about the acute and subchronic effects. But the chronic effects could take, you know, tens of years and we may be surprised 20 years down the line that there is still a lot of things that we're learning from uh, from the health study. So I think the last question we can take one more is, will vape THC oil show up positive on a blood test checking for marijuana use? 
So I want to add one thing here, though. So this, the term "wape" is a misnomer. It's an example of how language could be co-opted to certain propaganda. Vaping means a vapor is something that is, comes out of a liquid, just contains liquid, right? Uh, uh, it's different from an aerosol that contains liquid and particles, which we call it smoke. So the e-cigarette industry has changed the terminology to make it to never talk about smoking, to talk about vaping. And in fact, what the e-cigarettes emit is an aerosol. It's more a smoke than a vapor. Okay, anything about THC? It should. I, yeah. I didn't, yes. What is the uh -huh. question? Is it? And you were smoke, and you were in. Oh gosh, yes, absolutely. Because it's going to be. Yes, it's going to go bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to test that e sick poor part for THC? Are schools uh, confiscating these items? We would like a way to know if they're actually acquiring, slash storing THC. Mm -hmm. There's a way to know whether it contains TSC, but I don't know whether most schools would have that readily available to make the distinction. They might have sent out to a specialized lab to the CDC <laughs> to make the difference. It's in a TSC. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for our panel. And I do want to say thank you again to our sponsor who's allowed us to have this conference today, Kentucky One Health. Please join me in another round of applause for Kentucky One Health make it possible for us to offer this free of charge. So we're going to take a three minute break uh, so media can put microphones up here before we launch our press conference. We'll be announcing the results of some teen focus groups. May I have our youth expert panelists, our youth, yeah. and also Ben Chandler and Terry Brooks up here at the microphone, please. So, so um, moving actually in a couple different directions, one is to look at um, all types of marketing, including point of sales, and what you're actually exposed to, especially these new FDA regulations. I still see scores and around the school using advertising. Um, but then also, you know, the, the daily influence, you know, looking at their environment is what I'm really interested in because we looked at motivation. I'm good, how are you? And so I want to kind of delve deeper into that and the context type of research. And see a lot of the alcohol related context, like how people drink the <laughs> trying to understand better, you know, what is encouraging them to Big lot versus just big little. Oh, you have? So, yeah. We didn't get to go into it today, but oh, okay. um, ask about withdrawal or addiction questions. We asked about motivation. Oh, seventy percent. Then it's going to have a great good. Oh, good. Okay, you know, and we've good since we talked a little bit. Exactly. And I actually wrote down that you said that. Yeah. And you yeah. said that for example. Yeah. Ask you. Yeah. Ask what they're addicted. Yeah. Don't say sure. No, I'm not. I just need it. Yeah. 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 You know, but you're like, okay. Like, trying to find a normal, I think, could be one way to kind of use it. They have a, they have a train. Yeah, it's rich. That's another area. I said, so how to tell you? Yes. I know. So we all just place that all these jobs to Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, if I can have our youth panelists sitting at the table, please. Yep. We are ready to get started. If I can, Amy, I've got Terry, Katie. Go ahead and have a seat. Just a reminder, each of you will need to come up to the microphone for your remarks. Hey, Terry, Amy, okay. Get up. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, everybody who participated in the earlier part of the program. It was uh, quite interesting. Lots of lots of information for us to to uh, sort through. A lot of stuff I'm sure that a whole lot of people did not know, so I hope that it was helpful to everybody. We, I know I certainly learned a lot uh, about what's happening with uh, e-cigarettes and vapes and so on and so forth, uh, but the focus was uh, primarily on the national level, and we uh, uh, thought it was very important for us to try to understand a little bit more about what was going on here in Kentucky and what Kentucky youth are thinking about these products and whether the national surge in youth e-cigarette use is reflected here in the Commonwealth. Uh, so the foundation contracted with the Kentucky Youth Advocates to conduct focus groups at high schools in five communities across our state. We wanted to capture a broad geographic spread, so we agreed on doing the focus groups at high schools in McCracken, Monroe, Clay, Jefferson, and Campbell counties. So you've got uh, several different parts of the state covered there. Uh, our focus groups captured both rural and urban students and students at various income levels. And I'd now like to introduce Terry Brooks, Executive Director of the Kentucky Youth Advocates, to describe what the focus groups reveal. Terry, glad to have you. Thanks, man. Thank you. Well, Bonnie, I, I got to go off script for just one second to say that, uh, first of all, uh, I personally thought that uh, Dr. Darville's one slide with the lady speaking about smoking ban, you remember? That's the greatest slide I've ever seen at a conference. And uh, secondly, Ben had asked me to share with Dr. Purcell that uh, since you brought uh, that e-cig here, uh, he needs to see you after class. There's detention. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we at KYA uh, have as our, our vision that Kentucky is the best place in America to be young. All of you know that you can't begin to realize that vision without talking about health. And in 2018, you cannot talk about health and kids in Kentucky without talking about e-cigs. I really appreciate that Ben and the foundation uh, for the last several years has shown the courage to step up and tackle that very, very tough issue of tobacco use. And I also really appreciate the fact that they are pushing the edge on that policy stand up to speed, and, and that's why they have the uh, courage and the vision to tackle the issue of e-cigs. I also really appreciate the fact that while the foundation pays attention to important, high-quality attendant research, such as, such as what you already heard on the panel, they, they also listen to uh, that 1972 Chuck Mangione song, Look to the Children because they know that if we really want to know what's going on with e-cigs and young people, we need to listen to young people. Part of the research that Ben referenced, which we'll talk about in just a little bit in more detail, uh, 
the, the research is very clear. E-cig use is rampant. E-cig use is unregulated. And unless we as a commonwealth treat e-cigs as the health threat it is, you're going to hear more about policy ideas from Ben in just a few moments. But if we don't treat e-cigs as the health threat that it is, then in 2038, to borrow a phrase from Ben, Kentucky is still going to be the cancer capital of the nation. What did we hear from kids? We heard that there not only is a rampant use of e-cigs, but that there is an accelerating growth. Uh, there's an acceleration in literally recent months around the use of e-cigs. The kids asserted that they believed that educators and parents were clueless about that use. In checking with parents and educators, they confirmed they were clueless. So we, we've got a real adult kid uh, knowledge gap going on. Uh, the students themselves were very prescient, mirroring some of the uh, evidence that we heard from that first panel. They thought about uh, what their classmates uh, were using, because obviously there was not a single kid we interviewed who themselves used, but all of their friends uh, who used, they talked about, first of all, uh, you had that image of just being cool that's always percolated among tobacco products. They affirmed what we heard, that the marketing around those uh, flavors uh, were not accidental, but very intentional. And we heard a real knowledge gap where many, many of the students talked about that their classmates truly thought that they were engaging in harmless activities. Uh, they really picked up that if e-cigs were designed to help you quit smoking, surely they themselves could not be dangerous. Folks, let's be honest. In most things in life, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, sounds like a duck, probably a duck. If it looks like a health danger to kids, if it walks like a health danger to kids, if it sounds like a health danger to kids, then it is a health danger to kids. I would suggest to you that purveyors of e-cigs know exactly what they are doing in offering a gateway product to tobacco use, and we collectively need to call them on it. Kentucky's kids need our elected leaders from county courthouses to Frankfurt to act on those, their behalf. Those decisions around regulating e-cigs for young people will impact their health today and long into their futures. Here to talk to you a little bit about actionable ideas beginning in Frankfurt in 2019, I go back to Ben. Ben, again, thanks for giving us a chance to let student voice be heard on this issue. Terry, we really appreciate all the work that you all do for kids throughout the state. It's just uh, wonderful, wonderful work. Uh, we appreciate our partnership with you. Uh, we've got so many challenges, so many things you, that you all know we need to do. Uh, and as you can see, our uh, concern about the surge in e-cigarette use is uh, well-placed. Overall, the, the teen tobacco use in uh, this country has been heading downward on a downward trajectory for decades. And suddenly, really, truly, suddenly, we're seeing a surge in the wrong direction. Nationally, current use of any tobacco product by students rose from 19% in 2017 to 27.1% in 2018. Most tobacco use starts before the age of 18, as you've heard today. Uh, teen cigarette use uh, often leads to smoking uh, combustible cigarettes later. 
You, you've heard that also today. The risk then is that the downward trajectory for adult smoking in Kentucky also will take a sudden turn back upward. Uh, folks, uh, we can't afford that. You all know what the issues are. Uh, you all know what the cancer rate is. You know what the heart uh, disease rate is here in Kentucky. It's thoroughly unacceptable. It's worse here in any, than any other state in the country, essentially. And uh, we just cannot uh, continue <laughs> as the cancer capital of the nation. And as we also know, more cancers in Kentucky are caused by smoking than in any other state. That's why the foundation uh, and the Kentucky Youth Advocates together have recommended at least four policy measures to protect our kids today and to prevent a further resurgence of adult tobacco use in Kentucky. Number one, we think that e-cigarettes should be included in local smoke-free ordinances and tobacco-free school policies. They are a tobacco product that emits dangerous vapor, so they should not be used in workplaces and schools. Number two, Kentucky should add an excise tax on e-cigarettes parallel to the tax on cigarettes. Research shows that the higher prices on tobacco products actually reduce sales, particularly among youth, pregnant women, and those living on low income. Right now, there is no excise tax on e-cigarettes or vapes in Kentucky. <coughs> Number three, we think the state should seriously consider prohibiting the sale of flavored e-cigarettes. The FDA banned flavored cigarettes in 2009 because they appealed to kids. Today, you saw evidence that flavored e-cigarettes also appeal to kids. Number four, finally, we recommend that Kentucky allow cities and counties to enact stricter controls on tobacco products than currently exist at the state level. For example, raising the minimum age to per purchase tobacco products to 21 instead of the current age of 18. It's a lot harder for 17-year-olds to ask a 21-year-old to buy tobacco products than for them to ask 18 year old. These age groups don't typically hang out together. But a Kentucky city or county that wants to reduce youth e cigarette use by raising the age to buy all tobacco products cannot do that right now in Kentucky. State law preempts stricter, stricter local controls on sales and marketing of tobacco products. These policy rec recommendations are proven to reduce youth tobacco use. And by doing that, they will lead to lower adult use later on. Kentucky is already behind most other states in terms of tobacco use. So today we encourage leaders at the state and local levels to enact these proven e-cigarette policies so that for once, Kentucky can lead the nation in addressing a serious health issue among our children. And with that, Terry, I'm going to turn it back over to you to uh, introduce the panel. Thanks, Ben. Uh, the second panel uh, is sort of a, a Kentucky lens on this issue. And uh, we have with us uh, Katie Kelly. And uh, Katie, we really appreciate the fact that you've sacrificed and missed school today to, uh, to be here. Uh, Katie is a senior at uh, Martha Collins High School in uh, Shelby County. Uh, we have Eric Kennedy, who uh, is with the Kentucky School Board Association. And uh, we have Amy Barkley with us. Uh, and uh, we know Amy's role as a, as a leader in the whole issue of tobacco policy in the Commonwealth. So uh, sequentially, what we'd like to do is have Katie come up and uh, lend that all-important uh, youth voice to it. 
Uh, Eric is then going to follow uh, by talking about the role of schools and uh, how they can play a role in protecting kids' health. And finally, and we'll just do this so it's a little bit seamless, uh, we'll have Amy, and, and Amy is going to tackle two issues. Uh, Allison Adams uh, is not able to be here today due to a family emergency. So Amy is going to talk, uh, first of all, about lessons learned from the tobacco industry and their applicability to this issue. And then secondly, uh, talk a little bit more uh, about the role of public health departments uh, on this. So Katie, thanks for being here and we'll let you open this discussion. Okay, so I will be talking about um, who uses them, so, or why, why youth use them. Um, youth use them basically because they think they don't have nicotine in them and they think like cigarettes are gross. So the flavors obviously are um, a main part of it. Um, and coming from experience, I have actually used one not thinking that they were bad for you because um, my mom <laughs> is here and um, she, we talk about everything, but we have not talked about e-cigs or jewels or anything like that. And um, I was at a party and one of my friends was like, this isn't bad, it has, it's like a good flavor and it doesn't have nicotine in it. and it's safe for you to use. So I was like, okay, so I hit it. And um, then like a few weeks later, me and my mom and one of my friends were having a conversation <coughs> and um, she was talking about the harms of it. And I was like, oh, wow. I was like, this is really bad for you. <laughs> Maybe I should like not do that. <laughs> and, um, and so, yeah, like I know most of, it is so easy to use in school because it's so small and it's really easy to hide. Like most of my friends, They'll just put their head down and just hit it under their, like they'll put it under their sleeve like that, and then they'll just hit it and um, blow the smoke into their sweatshirt. Um, also, um, like with the jewels, um, sometimes they'll like, um, they'll malfunction and some of the juice will come up when they hit it. So the juice will go into their mouth and like they don't, I guess they like kind of spit it out because it's not like a good flavor when it is just the juice. Um, and, um, who use it? Like literally everybody, people you wouldn't think to use a jewel would use a jewel. Like the good kids use a jewel, the bad kids use a jewel, like every race uses a jewel. Um, so yeah. Okay, hello. Again, I'm Eric Kennedy. I'm with the Kentucky School Boards Association. Um, and I think, first of all, thank all my other panelists, and especially the last panel that was up right before we began. I think so much of what I had planned to touch on and say has already been spoken to already by some of our other experts. Uh, in thinking of what role schools and school staff and leaders and teachers in the classroom might have in helping to prevent youth uh, from smoking, any kind of device, and especially e-cigarettes and other vaping devices, I think first we want to mention, as is in the materials in front of you, a pretty large number of school districts already have tobacco-free policies in place by the local elected school board. I believe uh, just about half of the students in public schools in Kentucky are covered by such a policy in their district because some of our larger districts have adopted them. So we're not quite at the halfway mark yet on the number of districts. So I think at a certain policy level, uh, we are at you know, not where we want to be, but we're getting there with uh, school boards adopting these policies. But I think it's also, as, as is obvious from some of the information we've heard today, it's time to move to a more implementation phase of this beyond just adopting a policy. And so much is stacked against classroom teachers, principals, school staff in really implementing some of these policies for the very reasons we've already heard today. Um, as we just heard, you know, in the classroom, they are so, some of the new devices are so easy to use. They are so small. They look like things that a student should probably have with them, a USB device. Uh, you know, more and more students, that's on the required school, uh, school <laughs> materials list. And so a teacher glancing out of the classroom may not recognize what it is. They put off less and less of the big cloud of vapor that some devices do. So you think, you know, when it's so hard to see them in the classroom or anywhere on school campus, it might be hard to, you know, confiscate them, prevent them, or really just work with that student and explain the danger. Uh, some of the other things we've already heard today is that, you know, every student, as we just heard, uses them. All different sorts of students are using them, including the cool kids. 
you know, it is as we all know, either from our own kids in school or when we were in school, sometimes when you get into these discipline matters, it can be pretty tough when you call the parents in and maybe the parent says, well, I don't think it's a big deal. You know, don't, don't suspend my child. Don't put my child in detention. You know, I don't want my good kid or any kid uh, to get in trouble when, you know, I don't think it's a big deal. With everything that public educators do in Kentucky, everything we do is dependent on the parent support and involvement and public support. So as we are, as, uh, as Terry said at the beginning of this panel, when we do these surveys, such a huge proportion of people in general, uh, adults and you know, students, think, well, I just don't think it's a big deal. It's not harmful. It only puts out water vapor, all the things that the marketers have told us and that we've seen. So when we go to enforce some of these policies, you know, school folks are really uh, kind of up against it sometimes when the people we need support from equally say, I, I don't think it's harmful. I don't understand why this is a big deal. So those are some of the hurdles that we are seeing as we try to uh, combat this issue. And another that I'll touch on is, you know, I'm glad we're having this event today. In some ways, we're ahead of the game, but in some ways, as we see from these survey results, we are already, you know, time is so precious. And with this sudden surge in use of e-cigarettes and all the different kinds of devices, another hurdle that school folks have is, you know, almost, you can't suspend all of us. You know, you, you can't stop all of us when, you know, earlier today, someone said that they were talking to a student uh, maybe last week, and they said, well, everybody is using these even in the classroom, not even just in the hallways or in the bathroom, but right in the classroom. You know, so many kids are using them. That almost hurts our ability to prevent it because, you know, you catch one and you confiscate one device and you call their parents in and it's like, well, you know, you can't stop all of us. What are you going to do? It's almost in some ways too late to get out in front of it. But of course, that can't stop us from trying to do, you know, everything that we possibly can. Um, in the public, in public schools, we want to educate our students and also keep them safe. Of course, that is one of our primary goals and missions is to keep them safe. So I think at the point that we're in, certainly from KSBA, we have a model policy that includes all forms of vaping products and e-cigarettes that we uh, make available and sort of recommend being adopted out in the districts. But as I said, beyond that part, it's up to all of us, everyone in this room, everyone watching the live stream at the other locations to really support uh, each other and support the educators and the folks in the school district as we try to get out in front of this and really enforce and implement the policies that have been adopted. As we try to um, understand even amongst ourselves, I've learned things today about how truly harmful they are, that the marketing has worked. You know, so many folks will think it's just water vapor, there's nothing in it. Uh, so education and getting that messaging out to the adults in the room, that the adults in the lives of our children is probably the, the vital moment that we're in right now. Uh, at least from the school perspective. Hello, everybody. I'm Amy Barkley, a regional advocacy director with the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. It's good to see all you all here in Louisville, and um, welcome to all the folks out there in the state. In addition to thanking everyone that's already been thanked, I do want to thank those of you who are out there on the ground, our foot soldiers like Ellie and Emily and Others always hesitant to mention names, but all the folks out there in the field who are working with youth, working with smokers, and have been on this issue for 10 years or more. Um, and I'm really glad and appreciative of the foundation and uh, KYA and Kentucky One Health for putting this together so that we can develop a strategy. We're all already a bit behind the curve here um, trying to catch up, so um, I'm really happy that we're all here together to talk about this. As Terry mentioned, I'm here to talk to you all about the, um, the industry. And Audrey touched on a little bit of this, just like Eric, a lot of what I had planned to say was covered by our wonderful speakers. But I will kind of review a couple of highlights as well as talk about the industry itself. Um, first of all, it's been great to see the pictures of the products themselves. Um, as has been mentioned, a lot of us have not necessarily seen these. I thought it was great that Dr. Purcell brought her um, jewel to show how easily it is to conceal the products. But um, while the e-cigarette market has really evolved over time, um, all of these various forms of the product are still on the market today. As uh, Brian King mentioned earlier, we have the disposable um, cigarette-like um, e-cigarettes that are primarily produced by the big tobacco companies. Um, and then we have now the pods and the mods and, of course, Juul. So the products have evolved over time, but all of these types of products are still currently on the market. So I think it's useful to uh, review that. 
Um, you've heard a lot about the data here, including the rates that we have here in Kentucky, which are surprisingly similar to our smoking rate, but it may be due to the fact that it's self-reported data, which is generally reliable, but also kids may not know. We don't, for instance, on the, on the uh, YRBS ask the question, do you jewel? You know, some kids don't see jewel as e-cigarettes, as has been mentioned. So I'm not entirely certain that we're capturing all of it, but at any rate, even if it is 14.1% and that's <laughs> accurate, that's still too many kids. And as has been mentioned, kids that never would have smoked in the first place, too many kids using these products here in Kentucky. Um, I thought it was important to reinforce some of the things that our panelists said about how um, e-cigarette use, and Katie said this, is among all youth, even the quote unquote good kids, again, kids that never would have smoked are using these products. And the increase in e-cigarette use has driven a 38% increase in the use of any other tobacco product. And I think Dr. Gottlieb's um, quote here is really good on uh, Twitter, it looks like. Uh, some wrongly presume that kids who use e-cigarettes might have instead used cigarettes. So they'll say, well, at least they're not smoking. This is not true. Data shows most kids using e-cigarettes wouldn't have smoked instead. But now having initiated to nicotine, they're more likely to. Again, this has been articulated by the panel, but I think it bears repeating. And of course, dual use in adults is a big problem. I have a young, younger friend, she's in her 30s. She's very proud of the fact that she quit smoking um, eight years ago, and she is now using e-cigarettes. And I've tried to educate her, and I think, you know, we are seeing a lot of that. And again, parents are using this, and then that in turn is influencing kids. So again, as everyone has said, it's a huge problem. Okay, now to what I'm really supposed to talk about, which is the industry. I think it's important for us to know who is making these e-cigarettes and who is who. Because as Audrey said, and as I'll reinforce in a minute here, we can really look at the industry's past behavior to see why we are where we are with e-cigarettes. Um, it's really just the same old tricks, but with new products. Um, so before we had the cigarette companies, which then started buying up the smokeless tobacco companies and some of the cigar companies, and now they're in the e-cigarette business. So now we have Altria, which is Philip Morris, and they own a variety of other companies, including Newmark, which is the Mark 10 um, e-cigarette. And um, they also own Green Smoke, which is uh, one of the companies that's taking some voluntary actions to at least look like they are trying to be responsible. They discontinued the sale of uh, smaller packs of their products. They um, had been selling them in packs of 10, and so they said they'll stop doing that and sell them in packs of 20 like cigarettes. Um, British American Tobacco, which is, owns um, RJR, um, has the uh, Reynolds Vapor, which I think is, see, I'm gonna get it mixed up myself. What brand is that? I thought I had that in my notes here, sorry. <laughs> um, it's, is it blue? It is blue. Thank you, Elizabeth. Glad we have a lot of experts to help me out here. <laughs> and then we have Imperial Brands, which is um, actually uh, Phantom Ventures is, um, uh, that's actually blue. And then, and then in addition, like we said, we have Jewel, but we also have Cetera. And I want to mention them in particular. Um, they are the group that sued to be called a tobacco product years ago. And then of course, when the FDA decides to deem them tobacco products, they decide they don't wanna be a tobacco product. But it was the e-cigarette industry itself that wanted to not be regulated as a medical device or a smoking cessation aid because of the rigorous requirements there. They wanted to be um, a tobacco product. So fortunately, FDA has taken action on that and they, they are a tobacco product and it's firmly established. And I love Dr. King really emphasizing that this whole myth about some e-cigarettes not containing nicotine. I mean, maybe there's some out there, you know, in the vape shops, but primarily this is definitely a tobacco product. Nicotine is derived from tobacco. Yes, it does exist in potatoes and tomatoes and other vegetables in the nightshade family, but not in enough of an amount to extract it to be used. So again, our speakers have talked a lot about how it's really I love Brian's um, horse analogy and Terry's duck analogy, <laughs> but um, it is the marketing that has led the horse to water um, and then in turn the nicotine that gets them hooked and so forth. 
But um, if you, again, look at the expenditures and how they've exploded, this really does explain the rates. Kids are very um, subject to influence by the mass media. And we'll take a look a little bit at how these e-cigarettes have been marketed um, when they first started and then how that's evolved a little bit. So this is the quote unquote early days of e-cigarette marketing. <laughs> you know, I remember we had a conference in Lexington like in 2007 or so, and the e-cig people came. Do you remember that, <laughs> Ellen? And um, they were just this little team of activists out there, you know, and, and we said at the time, these poor people, they are gonna be out there opening these businesses <laughs> and they're gonna be swallowed up by the industry, but they will have laid the groundwork and, and we were right about that. Um, but if you take a look at some of the marketing, just like Audrey showed in her presentation, it's sort of the sexy girls, you know, appealing to both women and men. Um, you remember that from the old days with e-cigarette advertising. Um, I love the Santa Claus one that's been used in practically everyone's presentations over the years. Santa Claus, he doesn't always vape, but when I do, I choose Vapor Shark. Um, and then, of course, the flavor issue and the cigarettes being right next to the uh, the e-cigarettes e being right next to the candy and so forth. That reminds us all of uh of e-cigarette marketing. Now though, it's all pretty much social media for the most part. We were seeing some in magazines and those were some of the other ads, but these are online and social media posts and ads. So this is really where it's happening right now, which makes it hard for adults. You know, it's kind of understandable that teachers and parents are a little bit behind the curve because not all of us are on Instagram, for instance. Um, they're doing a lot of some of the things that the tobacco industry has historically done over the years, sort of the street marketing, the sponsoring festivals, and remember the Virginia ten, uh, Slims tennis tournaments and things like that. They're doing that um, all over the place, different types of street marketing. And again, social media marketing is extremely prolific um, still, if you, even though some of them have said they're going to um, reduce their marketing on social media so as not to appeal to kids. So here's some of the statements that Jewel made, but I'll, I remember hearing that this just made me so mad. The Jewel folks said, well, we had no idea that this looked like a, a USB drive. Um, we, had this, we had no idea that kids would be interested in this product. I mean, you know, even though they're not big tobacco, they sure have taken a cue from uh, Big Tobacco's playbook. Um, we produced, along with the American Academy of Pediatrics and a bunch of our other partners a few years ago, this flavor trap report. And again, going back to Dr. King's analogy, um, this is part of what uh, the flavors are what lead the horse to water to make them drink. And the nicotine is what keeps them. So we know there are more than 7,000 flavors as other folks have said. And it really is all about the flavors with the kids. And again, Jewel just being so, remember when the first generation of e-cigarettes, it was all about the biggest cloud that you could blow out and that kind of thing. It was really not very easy to conceal that. This has been, you know, obviously a game changer as everybody today has talked about. And um, I think in a sick way, this has really helped us because this has alarmed people. Like I have not seen people be alarmed about tobacco. I've been in tobacco control for 25 years and I've never seen this. I've never had like all of my friends who know what I do say, what is, what is this jewel thing? You know, they're so concerned about it. And so now really is the time for us to capitalize on the fear of parents and so forth to really try to do something about it. And I love um, the uh, outline that Ben presented for some uh, possible policy uh, prescriptions for this. This is a New York Times article that I commend to all of you. And I think Bonnie will make these slides available to everyone. It talks about one youth's experience. And of course, we've heard from Katie today about her experience in school. Um, I think just taking a deeper dive, all of us, and in turn, taking some of these great slides that we have today from all of our speakers to go out there and educate is really important. Um, and again, what's so shocking and horrible is the uh, market share of Juul. It's incredible that in just a couple of years, this is the main e-cigarette being used out there for all the reasons that we've discussed. There you go. Um, I'm gonna run through some of these. As, as Brian King mentioned, we have been taking some really good actions. And ever since the uh, Surgeon General's report, which is what a lot of us derived our slides from, <laughs> as well as the uh, National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, we, have ton we do have data finally after all this time of the products being on the market. 
and that is helping to drive our evidence-based approach to you know what we're going to do about this so i do want to really quickly cover what has been done at the federal level and some threats to what's happening at the federal level that i know people like dr king aren't allowed to talk about <laughs> as a federal employee, so that might be my main function today <laughs> to talk about things other people can't talk about. But um, you may know that FDA deemed, they called um, uh, e-cigarettes tobacco products in 2006, and the deeming rule does do some things, including minimum age requirements and warning labels and so forth, but it doesn't cover a lot of things. Um, some of our speakers talked about the poisoning, the nicotine poisoning from kids that are you know, seeing these brightly colored e-liquid things and you know, drinking them and in some cases dying or being hospitalized and seriously injured. Uh, and, and all these other things are really not happening um, and not part of the deeming rule. So um, it has been very commendable that the, that the commissioner of FDA has talked a lot about what they wanna do, called it an epidemic. That's a huge um, boost to all efforts and everything. Um, and you'll see that they are taking action about flavors. They've said that they want to eliminate flavors, um, but you know the proof will be in the pudding in terms of what they can do. But they are doing a good job of educating and elevating the issue, I think, so that um, others can take up the banner and take some important actions. So these are just a few of the things that FDA is doing, including a large educational campaign, seizing um, papers from Jules headquarters, doing an investigation. So this is all very commendable, all happening really this year. This is a terrific Washington Post uh, op-ed, if you haven't read it, that um, talks about how important it is and how this really is all about nicotine addiction and it's the flavors that are driving kids to these products. The companies in response to this backlash and all the concern from um, parents and teachers and health professionals are taking some voluntary actions. Again, as usual, just like the tobacco industry has always done, they try to do things that appear to be an answer to the problem. And that's happening again with e-cigarettes. Um, so this was when the rubber really met the road just last month when the FDA talked about their intention to restrict the sales of flavors, require stricter age verification. Actually, this morning I went on a couple of the sites myself, and all it is is you just have to say you're over 21. So something definitely needs to be done about that. So these companies, though, don't go, the, the, these actions by FDA and the companies just definitely do not go far enough. Um, it, you know, FDA has made some uh, mistakes along the way by delaying the pre-market um, review of products. Um, to uh, 2016, there's a lot more that they could do. Um, and right now, while FDA is doing a commendable job, at least trying to take some action on this, every year um, Congress tries to undermine that by undermining FDA's authority over these products. The House of Representatives um, has approved um, an appropriations bill that includes a rider that would seriously weaken FDA authority over both cigars and e-cigarettes. Fortunately, the Senate did not include any of these proposals in their bill, but um, these they're in conference right now, as Ben well knows this process, and something could happen where the House version does get into the final budget. Um, but uh, they have to address this by December 21st. So pay attention to this. Contact your Congress people. Um, we don't have a very supportive congressional delegation, except for John Yarmouth, our um, representative here in Louisville. The rest are fairly friendly to the tobacco industry. So it would be very important for people to reach out to their member of Congress with the simple message, do not undermine FDA's authority over e-cigarettes. I'm very concerned about e-cigarettes. That simple call or email to your congressman can make a difference. Um, and what happens here, I'm going to skip over the cigar stuff just because in the interest of time and talk about what it would do um, in terms of e-cigarettes. Basically, what it would do is it would make e-cigarettes subject to a rule that says it has to be a product, in order to go to market, it has to be a product that is substantially equivalent to products already on the market. Um, and so that means they do not have to go through a pre-market review, even though these are new products. In the scheme of things, they do not have to go through a more exhaustive pre-market review in order to be sold. So this is a serious problem, that those will be out there when really they should not have been approved in the first place. 
And as Ben talked about, there are a lot of things that we can do here in Kentucky, and I hope we will. Um, the FDA doesn't uh, preempt a lot of state and local activity, so we can do all the things that Ben mentioned. I'll repeat a couple of them. Already, a number of Kentucky communities, have, including Louisville, have included e-cigarettes in their smoke-free laws. Um, we do have a minimum sale um, to youth, a minimum age for sale to youth of, of 18 here. Unfortunately, it was the um, industry's language. The industry, just like they always do, they get involved in policy and try to change the rules. And they have a separate definition for e-cigarettes, so they are not defined in state law as tobacco products. So that's something we probably need to change. And we need some licensing for um, e-cigarette retailers. A tax would be ideal, um, but it's going to be a little bit difficult because we don't have a wholesale distribution process for e-cigarettes. So it's a little hard to... Um, you know, an act of tax to really make it work. But a number of states have done it, as has been said earlier. So um, here's what's been done. Um, I love the idea of Kentucky um, doing flavor restrictions. Um, it's only been done at the local level so far. It's a huge lift, but something we should continue to talk about. And then, of course, getting into Allison's presentation. Um, Allison isn't able to be here, as Terry said, and she's the president of the Kentucky Health Directors Association. I think the health departments are doing a really good job, but can do more, of course, to educate people, to do as much prevalence gathering, do things like the youth focus group, basically just try to gather information and keep this on the public's radar. So that's the primary role, is gathering data and evidence and uh, disseminating it of the health departments. But we all need to support that effort and try through every channel that we have to talk to people about this problem. I think I'll end there in the interest of time. Thanks very much. Thanks, Amy. Uh, I want to take just a second before we invite questions, and I'm kind of looking at Ben here so he can flag me if I'm uh, saying something wrong. But I think it's important. stress to you a couple things. First of all, uh, at least all of you from Kentucky uh, have a member of the state House of Representative and you all have a member of the state Senate. Do you wonder what kind of power it would be if as you left here today, you called, just made just two calls, uh, one to a, your representative, one to your senator, and said, hey, I'm just leaving a gathering, and here's what we heard about e-cigs and kids, and we expect action. Secondly, uh, the foundation and KYA has available for you uh, manageable bite-size information, uh, pieces of information that would be wonderful follow-ups. Uh, you probably do not want to send your representative or state senator a dissertation on this. A one-pager, pretty effective. So what I want you to, to hear is that, uh, that you can take what you've heard this morning and make it actionable by this afternoon. Uh, I also would invite you to join with the foundation and KYA around what's going to happen when the General Assembly convenes. Uh, the Blueprint for Kentucky's Children uh, has issues on both the uh, smoke-free uh, campuses, as well as e-cigs, and we would invite you to be part of that. The good news is that just last week, uh, at a summit around children's issues, we had leadership from the House and Senate, both blessed by the leaders of the House and Senate, and they both were very aggressive and very affirmative that if we bring them appropriate policies on these issues, they stand to take action. So we really have that actionable opportunity before us, and I know the foundation believes, and we at KYA believe, we, we've got to have your help to pull that off. So I think my role right now is to invite Q&A for both Ben and for the panel, and we'll start with, uh, well, who, facil who facilitated the focus groups? Uh, KYA folk, uh, facilitated the focus groups in all, uh, all the localities. That's to ensure 
all those uh, issues like qualitative research standards. So the same question, the same process, the same kind of annotations were made. So that's the answer to that. Um, Katie, uh, are jewels being sold at school from one friend to the other? And how are kids getting the money to purchase vaping products? Um, yeah, they are definitely selling them at school. Um, I was talking to my mom and Eric about this. Um, the eighth graders actually buy them for more money than what they are sold for because they don't know how much they are sold for, obviously. And um, But they'll get the money from, like, if they have a job or, like, they'll ask their parents for money. Like, I'll, I need money for food, so I have money. <laughs> and so they'll just use that and then buy the jewel. They'll give money to the – if they're not old enough to buy the jewel, then they'll give the money to the person who's old enough to buy the jewel, and then they'll get it from them. Are public schools required to send out info to parents regarding sick when they about drugs and alcohol use? Eric, I'm gonna... mic here, that way too. Sure. I'm on. So I think everybody can see and heard the question. To my knowledge, no, there is no explicit requirement that school districts or schools send out information that explicitly breaks out and discusses e-cigarettes, which really, again, goes back to what we've been saying about getting the awareness out first to ourselves, a uh, better level of awareness on what the harms are, uh, and then sending that, communicating that out. I will say one of the benefits, I think, of not either the locally uh, locally adopted tobacco-free, 100% tobacco-free policy within a school district is that the language does explicitly list, you know, vaping products, e-cigarettes, and the like, so that when that would be adopted in a district, there would be a, a level of awareness to the parents of that district. And I think that the language that we hope that we've had for at least a couple of years now for a statewide policy such as that would also then, if that was adopted, allow for this sort of communication to go out. Yeah. So there was a question of, are there action plans in place with timelines for this to happen? Are either adopting policies at a school district level or a statewide tobacco-free schools policy? It, um, within any district, as I said, almost half, I think, school districts in the state either have a 100% tobacco-free policy that explicitly says e-cigarettes are included, or almost half. A school district, the local school board, can do that at any time at all at, at, at any meeting it's not tied to any sort of calendar or basis so as terry said not only leave the room with a phone call to your state legislators but please we need more involvement and awareness with your local school board in each district so please reach out to them contact your school board members and ask that they look into such a policy if they don't already yes 42 percent of districts are covered and because some of those are our bigger districts that's 57 percent of students are protected um, so that map, I know Bonnie has that map, I think it's on the website. Um, if you're from a community that the school has not, the school district has not taken this up, please reach out to them and urge them to. Um, I, I think the, the next question, uh, are harms of e-cigs included in public school health curriculum? I'm not as, um, because school boards that I represent do not adopt curriculum, I'm not at the best person to answer that question. It probably, I would say, is a mixed bag. At the, uh, curriculum decisions are made at the school level in Kentucky, by and large, with site-based councils that are elected of parents and teachers of a given school. Uh, so that almost could vary by school um, in terms of what the actual curriculum, such as in health class, is discussing on e-cigs. And I think at least the next question, I think, is uh, can the PTA take on an aggressive education campaign on e-cigs and tobacco use? I can't speak for them or commit them to anything, but I think so. I think absolutely they could be our strongest partner to do that. Um, we, KSBA works pretty closely with the state PTA. We would love for them to take an even more active role on this. As I said earlier, everything that public schools do in Kentucky depends on public support and teachers and parent support. So that is probably the strongest group to reach out to and ask for them to as again, their members to become more aware and then to carry that awareness and messaging to all teachers and parents. Uh, I'd I just add two things, uh, and uh, Eric made a really important point, and Ben knows this. 
Uh, in Kentucky, there is a, a really delicate balance in Frankfurt when it comes to schools. Uh, their favorite two words are local autonomy. So uh, literally, uh, you could have two middle schools in the same district that treat uh, health curriculum and e-cigs differently. Uh, what I will tell you in Frankfurt, when it gets to a tipping point, when so many districts adopt a certain stance, that's generally when Frankfurt flips and says it's now mandated. Uh, the other thing I'd just add is uh, we've actually been very encouraged that the state PTA is a, uh, a really important core partner uh, on the blueprint for Kentucky's kids. That means that their leadership and policy groups have signed off on the blueprint agenda, which, as we mentioned, includes both uh, smoke-free schools and uh, the e-cig issue. So uh, how they do the campaign uh, probably is up to them. But in terms of where their head is, uh, they're supportive of that. And uh, this legislature will see an effort led by the Smoke Free Coalition. Uh, th this, by the way, today's event is our first foray, real foray, into beginning this process of raising awareness and beginning the process of going after some of these policy changes that we think will make a difference. But uh, we're looking in the uh, next session to do tobacco-free schools throughout Kentucky, and that would include e-cigs. So, you know, it, it, that's, that's going to be a real point of focus for all of us as we go forward. We're coming up, the, the legislative session is going to start next month, and uh, we're going to be talking a great deal about this subject. And this whole uh, boom of e-cigarette use, I think, has, has made this tobacco-free schools issue uh, much more important and uh, 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 timely right now. Uh, okay, we've heard from a school district that staff union contracts will not allow the schools to have 100% tobacco-free policy. Is this true? Eric. I think that's an interesting question. One of the largest school districts that is one of the few that actually has, to my knowledge, in place such a collective bargaining agreement with their staff is already has already adopted a tobacco-free policy of Jefferson County, which we are sitting in now. So typically, when that question comes up, very few districts have these kinds of union contracts in place. This is the one that most people even think of to discuss. So that's interesting that they already have the 100% tobacco-free policy in place. To the extent that there's about nine other districts that have much less robust contracts in place. I'm not aware of any personally that have this restriction that would keep uh, that district from adopting the policy, but those are not um, perpetual. So even, even if that were the case and that was a hindrance, whenever that contract would come up for renewal, then that would definitely be a possible time for adopting a policy if this is, in fact, the case that I'm not aware of. Amy, I think this next one's for you about deeming. Yes, yes. Uh, elaborate on deeming. Uh, where'd it go? It went away. It went away. I, got, I think I got the gist, ju the gist yeah, of it. And and, and okay. does it have does does it apply on the state level as well as the federal level? Um, the the deeming. I I think one of the things FDA did with this is bring back the word deeming. You know, um, the, you know, when you deem something, it's just you're calling it, you're naming it something. So FDA has deemed uh, electronic cigarettes as tobacco products. And as I said, at least Sotera, one of the e-cigarette companies, that's what they wanted. But then they all decided they didn't want it. But at any rate, it is deemed a tobacco product and will be regulated as such. And we talked a little bit about how the FDA still needs to take some action. But here on the state level, they are specifically not a tobacco product. Several years ago, Heart, American Heart, American Lung, American Cancer, Tobacco Free Kids, we worked on a bill back when all the states were passing um, age of sale requirements, um, you know, saying that just like cigarettes and other tobacco products, you can't sell to kids um, under 18. The industry came in, we had a bill that did call them tobacco products. They had a bill that said they're not tobacco products and just called them 
electronic, I can't even remember what they called them, vaping or something. But they specifically said they are not tobacco products so that they couldn't be regulated as tobacco products. And that's true for a number of states. Okay, here. Here's the third one. Oh, yes. I think you can answer now the second one. You can answer that one well. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, in addition to the industry themselves the, and the, the vaping community, if you will, um, there are other front groups that are sort of uh, libertarian pro-business groups that have sort of taken up this charge. And also, unfortunately, we even have respected researchers in our state that are still sort of harm reduction proponents that are, <laughs> that, right, that are, <laughs> we're not naming any names, any institutions, because we don't want to <laughs> sully the institution itself. But there are um, people out there who are still defending e-cigarettes despite this effect of having kids use them. So it's the industry themselves. The vaping community has organized as uh, the Kentucky Smoke Free Association. So co-opting our language, which is, again, very typical of industry activities. So there are a variety of pro-business, um, anti-government groups that have been sort of roped in by the industry and the industry themselves. So there's a powerful group against this. Oh, yes, indeed. Yeah, there have been a tremendous amount of expenditures. I'm going to go ahead and call out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm nervous about all the people out there that I can't see. But um, the Pegasus Institute is one of the newer ones. You all may be familiar with the um, Bluegrass Institute, which is sort of our libertarian think tank um, in the state. But now Pegasus is sort of the newer, cooler version of that. Um, and they're against a number of tobacco control policies, as well as we've seen the, um, well, we haven't been able to verify that. So I wish I could say that. It's, that's our suspicion. Ellen. Oh, yes, yeah, certainly Kentucky Farm Bureau continues to defend both, you know, all tobacco, use of all tobacco products and sort of try to hold back on um, regulation of those. So, yeah, we have, oh, yeah, I don't know the exact number. Yeah, I think number one, right? Uh, number oh, one. Uh, the the tobacco industry, just Altria, Altria alone, was the single biggest uh, spender in the last legislative session. Yep. In the entire state uh, for any subject. So. Oh, great point. Yes. Oh, okay. She asked about the uh, fine print that's in our most recent tax bill that um, specifically says that if a product, a tobacco product, is um, determined to be a modified risk or reduced risk product, it will be taxed at a level 50% below the taxation of other products. And this has happened in a number of states, and I'm embarrassed to say none of us even realized it until after session. We worked on the, on the tax campaign, and so we went right to, you know, the tax part, but it was buried way down deep in a 300-plus page bill. So we did not know about that. But that's them setting the stage for possibly having a reduced risk product out there and taxing it less. Well, and, and things also get added at the last minute. I don't know if you all heard about that, <laughs> but that happens. So there may be a good reason why we didn't yes. find out about it. Uh, and they, not only do things get added, things also get subtracted at the last minute. And one good example was the tax provision on e-cigarettes right. that was in the bill I and agree. suddenly it disappeared. And maybe you know, but yeah. I don't know how it got subtracted. Yeah, I, Do don't, I don't, but I will add that um, it's a mystery. the head, the head uh, government relations guy, the head lobbyist at um, Altria flew down from Richmond in the, at, you know, towards the end of the session, and they were, I think, successful. I mean, we don't have a lot of evidence, but in reducing the tax from a dollar increase to 50, 50 cents, then from adding that modified risk language and probably removing the e-cigarette tax portion. Um, you know, we, we knew we were being successful when they flew the guy down from Richmond, but he made a big difference in, you know, one hour. Well, and, and it shows what we're up against and how difficult this is, but, but I take a, a 
point of pride in making them spend so much money. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the fact that the fact that we made the big effort that we did, I think, led to a, a bigger push on on their part because they understood that there was a threat, and it just means that we have to redouble our efforts. As uh, I, I still believe that that there that we can win some of these battles. We've got to. We. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, and we haven't talked about the particular issue that you brought up yet. Yes. Uh, what what the next steps are, uh, uh, just generally, or the next steps about? How do we go back and address that problem, the, the language and the fine print? Uh, I mean, it's like you address anything else. You've got to have it removed. Uh, but it's easier said than done. You know that this legislature, we, we're dealing. I'm not going to go into all of this because you all know it, I'm sure as well as I do. But we have a long, long history of a tobacco culture in this state. We have a very strong farm bureau. We have uh, uh, the tobacco companies. We used to have 60,000 tobacco farms in Kentucky. Now, thankfully, we're down to about fewer than 4,500. But this is a, a long-term problem that we've got. So we have been fighting an uphill battle. Uh, our concrete steps are yet to be determined, certainly on this one. Uh, we're going to be talking about it in our coalition. But what it boils down to is that you've got to determine, whenever you go into a policy fight, you have to determine what you think is doable. You've got limited resources to spend. And you've got to decide where they can best be spent. And you've got to pick your issue, pick your battles. And uh, that's something that the group will be talking about as we head into the session. OK, regarding the harms of e-cigs and students using these products in the classroom, is there any evidence of e-cigs producing secondhand smoke? I think the answer to that is yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, in support of regulation on e-cigs, could the foundation put something together so agencies and coalitions could sign on in support? Well, certainly, we, yeah, I mean, we join the coalition is the first thing. But, but the coalition will be uh, working on this issue, I, I guarantee you. And, and you'll be, just stay tuned. You'll see a lot of things coming out uh, from the coalition on the e-cigarette subject. Uh, regarding the harms of e-cigs and students using these products. Oh, I already did that one. All right. Well, that's it. Any, anybody else have any questions? Yes. It, it 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 is it that is it. I don't know why that language isn't in there, but it should be. I mean that that's what we intend to do. Is 100 percent. Aaron? Yes, I think the question was <clears throat> this far into the school year, is anyone, the coalition or anyone else, sort of putting out some simple to understand guidance all the way to the classroom teacher on 
all of the things that we've talked about today, what these things look like, what the harms are, and so forth. Uh, I think there is a lot coming at the classroom teachers on this and every issue, probably not as streamlined as it needs to be, and that's a big part of what I think the coalition's working on. But part of the issue is this, you know, this is the one thing we're talking about all this morning in this room and with the other folks. There is just a great deal of reform top to bottom happening in public education in the state right now. We're probably we're almost at a level of being overwhelmed, if not beyond that point, with a lot of, you know, the accountability system and curriculum and testing and so forth. Pensions, <laughs> gradu graduation requirements being a totally different, moving in a different direction. So issues like this, it's unfortunate it's easy for an issue like this to get lost in the shuffle of the massive amounts of information coming at classroom teachers and superintendents and everyone else in the district. So I think that's something that we will keep working on, um, but that's always going to be an, a part of the problem, I think. And the enormity of this is, is it, this is a very re this is a very recent phenomena. The the surge yeah. is a recent phenomena. So I don't think anybody has realized just how uh, how dire this issue is and how quickly it it has become. So did did you want to say something? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I know in, um, at Collins, my teachers have been like aware of what they look like and how like what to do. But like in past, they didn't really, they like would take them away and sometimes give them back to the students. But now they are aware of like how bad they are and the effects of them. So they take them away and don't give them back and call their parents. And yeah, this because the students, they cost so much money that they don't want them to be taken away. So. <laughs> on providing everything that I know they can go. Mm -hmm. And I also know that and they've gone back to the boys three and four times didn't meet my it it missed a sentence about if a school bus driver was on a field trip and was mo and that was the only sentence out of that and it doesn't have much so is there potential for those three very powerful education send out to every school to every district so that we're proactive in this rather than reactive? Yes, absolutely. The question was, is there a way for sort of one widely agreed upon acknowledged policy language for a school district, a school board to adopt that crosses all the T's and dots all the I's to be sort of pushed out, not just they have to come ask for it or find it, but to make that available. Um, I, there is, and I think we've seen some of the issue we've seen uh, very recently even was a local health department had worked with their school board to adopt a model policy, and it was exactly what you said. There was something about a, a field trip, um, a, a field trip sort of not being, not falling under the policy, whereas KSBA, one of our big services to all of our member districts is crafting model policies such as this. So we have, we think when this came up even just two or three weeks ago, some of the partners of the coalition and KSBA as a member got together and we think that our model policy will do it. Um, so that not only is available at any time for a district that doesn't have it adopted yet to call us and ask for it, but we push, we sort of push those out once a year at least. Um, and that is something at our last big training event where you know several hundred board members were there. We actually discussed this at a plenary session, the issue, the topic, showed them what the language looked like. So we are always trying to push that out in a more um, direct way, and we will continue to do so. One quick, one quick action that we can all support here. Um, I cover 10 other states besides Kentucky, and several of my states have, their state health departments have issued an advisory about um, e-cigarettes. And in fact, Tennessee did it years ago. I think they were one of the first states to do it. So I'm sure um, our DPH folks can't do this on their own. So, I mean, we could all call our legislators, you know, as people outside of state government, we can ask that, you know, the state health department do this because that made it to the news and it was widely distributed. So I'm sure it's something of the professionals in the agency are ready and willing to do, but obviously it's somewhat of a political issue. So anything we can do from outside state government to support that. We can do that as well. Yes, we can. <laughs> That's a good idea.
Do you, Amy? Some I'm sorry. Have, have, have flavors, where have they oh. been banned? Oh, wow. Okay, well, most notably, San Francisco enacted a, a ban on all flavors, including menthol cigarettes, which is a big deal. But I think there are over 150 um, localities. We actually have the list on our website, tobaccofreekids.org, so you can look it up. But a lot of them are in California, Massachusetts, Minnesota. Brian, can you think of any of Providence, Rhode Island? Yes. Statewide, right. But so far, it's just been local. And one of the important things, while we're all very concerned about e-cigarettes, and that's a huge deal, we really, since San Francisco, want menthol cigarettes included. People are very um, up in arms, which again is good in a sick way, um, about e-cigarettes, but we don't want to neglect menthol cigarettes. Um, so that's the type of flavor ban that we prefer, is menthol in all flavors. Well, in the FDA. Yes, the, the, and they're considering that. The FDA, they put a, a proposed rule. Right. They put a proposed rule out to ban menthol cigarettes. Yeah, but I will say, it, look how long it took them to deem um, e-cigarettes tobacco products. So we're hoping that a number of states will do this and it'll continue so that that supports FDA to get everybody else. <laughs> I hate to close the questions. There's some excellent questions, but I will tell you that our speakers will remain afterward for one-on-one -on -one questions, especially for media if you have additional questions. Thank you all so much for joining us today here at this conference. Please join me in another round of applause for our speakers and our sponsor, Kentucky One Health. Your organization is interested in joining the Coalition for a Smoke-Free Tomorrow, which put on today's conference. It is free. There is no cost to join, and you can go to smokefreetomorrow.org to sign up. Or you can reach out to either me or Alexa in the back corner, and we'll sign you up. A note to media, like I said, several of our speakers will remain. I have two housekeeping items before I let you go, please. First. We will be sending out an email survey regarding this conference. Your responses are very, very important to us. They help us control the quality of our uh, conferences and give us great information. It will take no more than five or 10 minutes of your time. So please fill out that um, e-cigarette uh, survey about this conference. And also it will give you instructions for getting your official CEU record of attendance. Second, if you just need a printed certificate of attendance, they're going to be available out here at the registration table. Pick that up on your way out. And again, thank you to those of you in the remote viewing sites. You can pick up your certificates of attendance as well. Finally, to everyone here, we will be posting the video and the presentations from today on our website. We'll do it as quickly as we can, hopefully by tomorrow, if not this afternoon. I'm getting a thumbs up from my wonderful right arm over there. Um, and so please visit that site to pull down those um, presentations and share this information. We've heard a lot about how important it is to share this information. Again, thank you all for coming. Have a great day. Travel safely. Yeah. Hi. Oh, hi, Berlin. Nice to meet you. Oh, mentor kids. Cool. Yeah.